allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It should be noted that all five board members are present. There has been an agenda review. There are no changes in the agenda. Uh, moving down to six, and uh, six superintendents report. Uh, good evening, board, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. I just wanted to take a few minutes to walk through some of the things that have been taking place in the district over the well, since the last time we met. Um, first of all, uh, right afterwards, it was Halloween, or the 29th, which is the version of Halloween that we had uh, here before the weekend. And so some great costumes out there, Mary Casey Black and Mary Parade. Uh, a little tradition that took place just right outside this building, where the fifth graders uh, built a biography cemetery uh, for Halloween too, so that was fun to look through and see all the great projects that were there. Um, and also our new alternative education school uh, also had a trick or treat event for their students to come by and be part of. So to see three of the really creative ones that are there. So great job to them. We had a really really special uh, early evening on the 29th where the Redwood School Multi-Purpose Room was uh, dedicated to a long time community volunteer um, and, and former employee Alicia Morales Ramirez and. You see a picture of all 10 of her children that were there for the event out in front celebrating. So sadly, it should have passed a couple of years ago. Uh, but it was really a special event. We get a chance to, to drive by and see it. There's a special plaque out front, and inside uh, the office is a little description of all she's contributed to the community. So um, it was a great event. Um, also, another, uh, this is a little later, or so on the 29th. So Pioneer also had a truck or treat event that took place that night. And uh, parents Club coming in on, so I really want to say a special thanks to the Parents Club out of Pioneer for organizing that. And then another great Parents Club out at Redwood Elementary putting together uh, a movie family event. So to see families continue to be creative in, in trying to find ways to come together during the time that we're in with the guidelines that we have. And then November 1st was a uh, professional development day across the district. So uh, you can see this is uh, the Mary Missy Black staff uh, working around. And so they were working on learning targets and success criteria. And so thanks to all of our staff members and our curriculum team to put that together. Um, again, I want to say a special thank you. I've got a couple of pictures in the slideshow of some of our great parent art doses. Uh, this is Missy Mills in uh, and Mrs. Reed's first grade, first, Mrs. Brett's first grade class uh, at Cray. These kids were having a great time as they were working on this project. Going forward. And then Edna Hill, uh, I want to thank uh, or acknowledge uh, Ms. Jenkins. She's, she's teaching these kids to program these robots. And so they're working together. You can see one with the robot Chromebook. And they're working together on a lot code to put together uh, commands for robots to move around in different parts. So it's fun to watch if you haven't had a chance. Out at uh, Bristol Middle School, you can see Ms. Stafford's math class uh, learning to figure out a way to make soup. By adding integers, so we have many math learning fun. So uh, lots of great things going on out there. Um, Miss Martin's uh, fourth graders out of Ronan got a special treat where they got to participate in a webinar that was hosted by the author of Wonder, uh, who has a new book out called Home. So they were able to interact in that way. So a neat thing that technology brought us. Um, uh, I want to compliment the Marsh Creek Parents Club who partnered. Uh, with Violet to do a blood drive out in the community. And uh, so this was a, a, a fully mobile blood drive that came out and the family signed up and it went specifically uh, to help uh, a child in the community. So it was a really, it was a special, a special event. Um, and they had really good snacks at the end. That's always my favorite part of getting blood. So um, uh, Loma Vista uh, second grade students uh, did some projects uh, through an art class that focused on uh, creativity and, and really it was a social emotional learning opportunity for them. We share that going forward. And then right at the time of year where we start to see some of our walkthrough experiences where students learn parts and learn um, about some in-depth historical events that took place. So this is a walkthrough California 
uh, group there at uh, Marsh Street participating in that. All of the fun of that. And then Ms. Francis, second grade class, out uh, did some sand art and did some decorations for Galal to celebrate that out uh, with her class. So we get out there for everybody to see. I got to come over and watch um, in this room that we're here right now on the eighth. Uh, is the first graders were learning how to square dance. So this was their first day. So they were they were starting from the very beginning with the small dance and circle left, but they got to some element lefts, and, and I think they did it a second before I, I ran it. So, but they were they had been getting ready for a video performance for their families. I love this picture. But this is uh, Ms. Totley's second grade class at Ron Nunn, who wrote some of the character qualities on their classmates that they appreciate on pumpkins, and they were trying to encourage each other and spread kindness. So it was fun to that for them. And then uh, this is a, a fifth grade class at Cray uh, that was conducting a Boston Tea Party experiment um, by, uh, by looking at the saturation of tea in cold and warm salt water. Uh, so we're going to do science and mix that together with fifth grade American history. Uh, Adams and Bristow, you can see some of our participants out in Unified Sports. Uh, this was a, a soccer. Uh, event that took place uh, in, in the combination of Special Olympics. So, great job to all of our athletes out there. And then uh, I think we saw maybe Emmett Hill last week, but on November 10th, uh, some of the eighth graders at Bristol uh, not only took care of a uh, baby, but they also had a complete assignment, uh, complete assignment while they had that baby uh, with them. So, uh, it's a fun way to learn how hard home with kids. Uh, had some Veterans Day celebrations on November 10th. Uh, so this is a, a really special event where Elaine Soto, uh, she surprised uh, by her father in, in a video chat with class. And so he's currently in Kuwait, but the technology available now, he's able to uh, video chat into the classroom. And so and, and him for a service, and, and I love that picture of her reaction in the top right corner when she sees that. So just a really special thing. Mr. Machina's fourth grade class out at uh, Loma Vista School. Uh, work together uh, to collect items for soldiers and partner with Operation Pizza to create care packages that will go out to those soldiers. So you can see some handmade flags in addition to down on the cart, they collected some food items and some and wrote some cards as well. So great job, Mr. Mondo, of her class. This is Isaac Flores. Isaac Flores is a private elementary first grader who uh, participated in an essay and drawing contest for a Veterans Day event on the open. Um, and, and was selected to be honored. Um, behind him, it's, if you can see it just behind him there, is a picture of his aunt, who was a former Marine who passed away several years ago, but each year the family uh, honors her, and so this is part of that way of honoring her. So congratulations to Isaac. And then uh, here's another walk through California, this time at Ron Nunn, so you can see it progressing through the schools as it goes forward. And then uh, this is, I showed you an earlier part of those picture. So these are some second graders. This is, um, I want to make this is Burke. You can see her there in the top corner. So she was um, working in Mrs. Snodgrass's class and teaching them about George O'Keefe and Claude Monet. And then they got to complete projects in, uh, in those designs going forward. And then I want to remind everybody that coming up on Thanksgiving morning is the Turkey Trot. It's a joint fundraiser for both uh, Rockwood and the Liberty School District for athletics and PE programs, and so it's a great opportunity. I think they've had over a thousand people sign up already. And it is a run walk, and so there's lots of people that walk, so I feel like it's not run. And that is my report for this evening. Thank you, Doug. Board member comment or any committee reports? I attended the round table with State Senator Later and, and like, your place. I also like to report that I uh, had four sweat visits uh, one at Mary Peace of Black, one at Marsh Creek, Bristow, and Hill. It was an honor and privilege to see our teachers and students while having them living color. Um, I had a great experience with meeting some of the teachers and staff. And the vice principals and hearing from them. I appreciate the opportunity to visit those schools and I look forward to visiting others. Thank you. At this time, I'll take a motion to open the public hearing. 
Move the bill on public comment. Second. Any public comment? All those in favor of opening public comment, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Remarks are limited to three minutes per person. Well, we encourage your comments. Unfortunately, state law prevents us from discussing items that are not on the monthly uh, meeting agenda. Public comments can be made uh, online or during an appropriate agenda items. We do take them very seriously and appropriate. We will have staff uh, follow up with you. At this point, I'm going to call uh, Carolina. Carolina. Um, good evening, board and members of the community. I just wanted to come up and uh, just clarify something that's been buzzing around the community um, regarding the vaccine mandate. Um, according to the press release from the governor's office released on October 1st, um, quote, based on current information, the requirement is expected to apply to grades 7 through 12 starting on July 1st, 2022, which means that for the remainder of this year, both in Brown Union and Liberty Union, there will be no vaccine mandate. So I know there's people that are very passionate about this issue. And uh, since this is a non-issue, I would like to offer alternative actions that people can take in the community that would be very fruitful to our daily lives. Um, first of all, Measure X, which we all voted for, based on the promise of fire funding, which we are short three fully equipped and staff fire stations in Brooklyn, and the meetings are going on now. So I encourage people who are passionate about safety in Brentwood to please call in the meeting or send in written comments and make our voices heard because if we don't make our voices heard, we're not going to get that fire funding. Um, second, there is also uh, redistricting going on at the uh, for our federal representation, state senate, and state assembly. That's if we draw the line ca.gov. So if you go on that website, you can find the maps and take a look at look to see what our district looks like now, because it doesn't look like the way it looks like in the future, it doesn't look like the way it looks like now. Um, also, there were drawn districts for uh, board of supervisors for Contra Costa County, and um, there are five meetings in, so feel free to log in there and give some commentary. Um, and also, the city of Brightwood is redrawing our city council representation lines. So, if you're interested to see how that's going to pan out, that's also um, get. And I didn't bring my glasses, so ooh, Redwood, CA got up. Um, also, I'd like to address the board directly. Uh, I have to leave as soon as I'm done here because I don't have a babysitter tonight, and there's a lot of parents that would like to uh, be part of these meetings, but they cannot come to make public comments. So there has to be a way that we can do this from home. Uh, we need robust representation and robust ability to participate in these meetings. Uh, especially because there's a lot going on and you need the feedback from the community. And I know that one of the objections is, well, people are going to come from out of town. We have it for Brighton Gate for City Council. People call in from as far away as San Jose. But, you know, the, the reason why I wrote it down is because the overwhelming number of citizens who logged in and raised their hands on Zoom and said no. First, there are some people in the district I need to publicly thank. When I was concerned that CRT was going to be taught, I spoke to my phone who told me this was not in our school district and won't be. Then, when I had concerns about the breakfast planning for the children, primarily sending to us cash, had the FDA approved cancer causing chemical called BHT, it's actually banned in Europe. I called and spoke to Kristen Neeson, who was very accepting when I asked if we could switch to Cascadian Farm cereal that doesn't have a chemical. Then, when I wanted to speak about funding, I spoke with Robert Schmidt, who spent an hour with me on the phone, and I learned a lot, especially about unrestricted and restricted funds, that the state can swap out funds 
Not in my opinion, we are underfunded, and it's easy for the state to say they funded the schools when the school funding hasn't really increased since the late 1960s, and which each of these calls I usually call from the full 11 with guidance on who the correct person to reach out to is. I call often, and never once has she seemed annoyed, and she's always been unbiased, and never has she given me her personal opinion. I want to thank you all for your time and your education. The reason I'm here today is because I wanted to address the vaccine clinics. They know when we sent that communication on November 8th, validating parents' concerns on vaccines, when we said they aren't likely this school year, that gave us a breath of fresh air. It was also sent out right before the vaccine clinics notified us that the, there are infiltrations in our schools. And this is why I'm here. I am not saying not to host the clinics. I'm asking you not to host it during school hours. Even though the clinics aren't going to administer the vaccine unless the parent is present, there's wordings in the district primarily that students in grades 7 and 8 can be released for confidential medical services without informing parents, legal guardian, education code 46010.1, or that the World Health Organization states implied consent for vaccines would be sending your child to school. Again, I don't think the district, or I don't even believe the district, would allow for vaccination in minors without parental consent. But I'm asking the district to respect our concerns and to have a happy meeting by hosting the clinic before or after school, or even when schools are in session. The last thing I'll touch on is the COVID mandates. The unjust masking of students, there's a lot of parents in this room who have had their child sick with the cold that's going around right now, and we ask students about that. I hear a lot of people frustrated at the districts on vaccine mandates, but they honestly, the district, has no say. And if they go against the government, the funding will be cut and they will be held personally liable. The frustrations need to be redirected at our government. Nuisance emergency, order enforcement masking. The government is responsible for this and they will try to hide behind the school boards. We are fighting the wrong people. I'm at the schools I frequently visit the board and I can tell you most of them don't want this. So with that said, write to the government, write to the county and start going to city council meetings. Remember, evil will never prevail. People say where they are trying to divide us, but I can tell you in this pandemic, I've united with more people than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Christinas, and tonight I'll be speaking on behalf of the Robert Teachers Association as the president. We appreciate being with our students and having a sense of normalcy. Thank you to everyone who worked diligently to keep us with our students. What I have you tonight for compassion. With so much division in our society right now, our teachers need to know they are cared about. Every teacher, student, and person on campuses is valuable and integral to the operation of our educational system. We are headed into more uncertainty, and no one should feel like they are unimportant or unworthy of care. Teachers feel isolated, alone, and overwhelmed. They need our school board and the district office to remind them that we are one whole team, like a family. They need you to come on site visits and spend a few minutes praising their efforts and caring and just showing them some compassion. Teacher morale is low. We've changed and flexed multiple times in the last year and a half, and we're still asked to do more. We're still asked to do more. Nothing is ever removed from teacher plates, only added. Today was our first negotiation day, and we appreciate the efforts put in by both teams. We look forward to a swift conclusion to showcase the great amount of collaboration put in. This is an opportunity to show teachers that they are valued. We had site reps come to our meetings and talk about the need to address the wellness of teachers. We've created a wellness survey that we're going to be sending out to gather teacher experiences from all of our partners, such as students, parents, admin, board. We're going to bring that data back to share with you, hopefully by the next board meeting. We want to work with you to use that data to help our teachers feel appreciated and cared for. We need to have compassion for all of our teachers' needs, beliefs, and challenges that they might be facing in the near future. Thank you to the board members and district personnel that continue to do site visits. We need to see you. We want to engage and chat about our students and experiences. You can make a huge difference by showing compassion and engagement. 
Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Michelle, I'm going to put a couple of really good masks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I cannot get the vaccine, or I really couldn't get it. Many people in my same exact situation have experienced it. I'm not going to do that. My kids need me, my own children, and my kids at work. Even if I could get it, I wouldn't want it anyway. And it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, that's my choice, my decision. I test weekly so I can keep my job. Here are some, some concerns. My name has been on a sign-in sheet at the table where everyone tests and sees my name. The test that they use every week is inconsistent. They change it every week. The swab that they use is also inconsistent. Half the time the swab has a chemical on it that's been known to have people in my situation health problems. But I do it anyway because I have to or I lose my job. There's also been boxes with envelopes with all of our confidential information sitting for anyone to see. I have a photo of you if you want to see it. My last, latest um, concern about the test, along with many other employees, I received a bill. We were told in the very beginning before any of this happened that the district was using COVID funds to pay for this test. That's not true. My insurance and all of our insurance companies have been billed. Luckily, my insurance covers it in full. Other people's don't, and they receive the bills that they're allowed to pay well. But I still go because I need my job. My students need me. I'm concerned that admin and the board are being told that the entire district is in 100% compliance. That's a lie. That's not true. There are several aides and a teacher on an unpaid leave right now with no medical benefits. They didn't receive a letter so that they could get medical benefits from their spouse. That's a violation of our contract. There's something new you want to require that's fine to put us on leave, but to take our pay and our benefits? Clinic and Edna already discussed. I represent teachers and aides in this district that are being harassed on a daily basis. At lunch, I have people move away from me. I shouldn't have to deal with that. I encourage every single one of you, and all of you, you all know me, call me, email me. I can tell you what's really happening. Because what you're being told is not true. My child won't get it. And if he's touched, I will sue like the lawyer on the table. Thank you. Does anybody else have a desire to speak? Can you fill out a release? Can you fill one out, please? Okay. Thank you. Just remain this one, you don't have to get a detail. This country is a joke, and you're losing your freedoms very quickly. And um, there is a lot of, as uh, Michelle stated, um, that there's a lot of prejudice and um, just uh, segregation and everything that's happening. 
And I'm a mom, and um, I used to teach back in Ireland, I'm not teaching now, but I want to um, say that um, I've been following so many amazing doctors that are against these vaccines. There's um, a lot of damage, and hundreds of mothers who have damaged kids from vaccines from heavy metals, and um, the, um, what is it? Um, the, Inside, there's, you know, they're, and actually, they're not putting the ingredients on, so we don't even know fully what's in that vaccine. It's completely poisonous and toxic for our bodies. And, you know, there's, um, you know, well, when we know the hundreds of moms, when we've seen their tears have gone to the state capital, um, uh, you know, up to 20 times I've met um, Judy Markovich, and I've met um, JFK, um, Robert Kennedy Jr., sorry, and, um, you know, these people inspire me that they're standing up for their country, and, you know, um, yeah, there's actually, there's a graphene oxide, that's the word I should think of, graphene oxide in this vaccine, okay, and it's extremely dangerous for our health. And I see this country as kind of like, there's like a big corporation for pharmaceutical industry, you know, it's just, it's like a lot of people are sick. When I moved here, my son was eight years old, and he asked me, he said, well, why are so many people sick in this in my class? Not many people are sick back in Ireland. I mean, of course they're pushing it now. You know, as well, you know, but um, there's just the, the pharmacy is having all the power, and the people are not getting the choices, they're being segregated every which way. And um, I apologize now, I don't have a speech, but I completely support um, Holly and um, Michelle, and we're trying to work more now because we're trying to um, unite together and figure out ways to actually make a difference here. We Thank you. Join. Hi, good evening everyone. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak. I actually also did come here from here. I'm a mother. So I think my kids went to Adams in the school. We are now a heritage. There's two different meetings going on between Contrast Channel and the Ruby Unicorns High School District and the university. And I chose to come here for the little kids. My topic is also about the vaccine mandate that we fear is going to come. My stance is really to fight for the freedom to choose and not to coerce and force people. Right now, the kids who know nothing about it and have their parents make a decision. Um, of course, I also support the issues that are going on with deployment, but a different topic right now. My focus is the children. It starts with um, my children thinking about them. Have they been in the five to one age category that is impacting them because they're in the older category? Were they where, where it is now approved? And possibly many. I am also a clinical researcher, and currently the last 25 years have been in clinical research. I understand the regulatory um, process of getting a drug approved, and in this case, it's a gene therapy. I've been, I'm also working in a biotech gene therapy company right now. There's always, always topics of inflammation in gene therapy. With that said, it goes back to this. We have basic right to choose, especially when right now the product for five to eleven year olds is a EUA, which is not an approved product for them to use, but only other emergency use. And come to think of it, only if it's considered during a pandemic, which our government said again for the third time, we are under a pandemic in the California. That is not true. So what I ask is make sure we have these vaccine clinics out there. 
that people just go there to think that, oh, it's safe because it's just like the other vaccine. But given the information, because by law, by the regulations, this is clinical trials, by law, you have to give them, you have to give them the right to be consented. You consent them by giving them, giving them information about what's about to go on. These children can speak for themselves, at least give them the education. Not only saying this is good for you, but give both sides and let them decide. Some of our population don't know where to start with the other is following the questions. We owe it to these children for their safety. Thank you. Thank you. Any other slips? I'll take a motion to close the public. I move that we close public comment. A second, please. A second. All those in favor of closing public comment, please start by saying aye. Aye. And keep by the zero public comment is now closed. Uh, agenda item eight. Does anybody wish to call any of the consent items? It's uh, eight point zero and eight point four. Now we're going to uh, pull and discuss and uh, we provide the consideration for the one. Second, please. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving consent items 8.0 to 8.4 signify by the same way. Aye. 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 With this, uh, in closed session, we heard uh, in regards to the expulsion of student 01 20 10. At this point, it's this time I'd like to take a vote in regards to uh, the expulsion. All those in favor of agreeing with the expulsion of student 01 20 21 10, signify by saying aye. I give I did a motion. I'm sorry. I, I move that I move that we accept the recommendation of the panel. Yeah. 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 We have a motion and a second. A motion and a second. All those in favor of uh, the expulsion of recommendations to the fact that we say Opposed? Expulsion passes four to one. Update on the first interim report. This would be wrong. Good evening, board. Tonight is tonight to sort of do, instead of doing a super really long. Um, Conversation in at the December meeting on the first dinner, we sort of break up two meetings, so this is sort of an introduction to the budget update um, for the first dinner that happened tonight. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about enrollment of EDA. So, as you can see here, this sort of shows a picture of our enrollment of EDA history over the last three years. The bottom line, the purple line, is last year's enrollment. And the history of enrollment last year, you can see that we sort of started out and really didn't grow at all. We were sort of flat on the The top line is what, what our enrollment looked like in 1920, which is really what our EDA is based on. And you can see that where we were up there, we, were up, we ended up with about 9,200 kids at the end of the year on that year. Um, about 9,300. And you can see the green line in the middle is where we are now. And it shows that we're, we're clearly better than last year. We're growing. Um, but this is sort of looking at the difference between the three years. And we're growing now, we have to monitor and see if that's going to continue. And there's lots of variables that affect that based on what happens locally, the economy, as well as governmental actions. This is another look at enrollment. This is actually looking at this year. The black line, which is the enrollment information on the right axis of the graph, shows that that's our enrollment is growing this year from day one. We've grown about 120, 125 kids. Uh, from when we started the year. 
The other line, which is the axis on the left-hand side, is the grade level. So you can see the bottom line is our current kindergarten. So you don't see TKs on here because that's about 175 kids. It makes the graph look really weird. So that's that's not on there, but it would, it would be down much lower. And the top line, the, the brown line all the way at the top of the line, is our current eighth grade. If you add our TK or, or K, that, that ends up being about, about 1,000 students. is about 50 students less than our current eighth grade. So at the end of this year, if nothing changes, when our eighth graders leave, then we get about the same number of kindergartners, and we have the last couple of years, we start at 50 kids lower. We have to make up that difference before we start growing again. So that's just, we have to watch that. It's not as bad as it used to be. Um, it's getting closer, but also the gaps now not getting any closer. So we have to watch that for the time. Um, but it does affect our own projections and what we do with um, in the next two years. Third, as you look at enrollment, well, clearly our enrollment is growing. This chart on the left hand side shows our ADA for the first five reporting periods of the school year, which are about a month long in each, shows an average of 10 ADA, that's the percentage of kids that are actually in, in class. Um, it shows the average ADA of about 96.6 to 97, about 96.6% ADA. This year, just the first two reporting periods, which is about as far as we've gotten, they're closing up the third reporting period. We'll have that for you in December. You can see our average ADA is 93%. 1% ADA is about 92 kids, or about $795,000. You can see we're about 3% below that where we were in 1920. So when you look at enrollment growth, while well, enrollment growth is going up, our ADA is actually going down, so it's sort of offsetting one another. And a different way to look at that is this graph. In 1920 and 2021, it shows the ADA that was reported and used for the district. In 2021, the government um, through legislative action, held us harmless. We got to use our 1921. The LCFF calculator is the best of the current of last year, so we got to use last year's ADA for this year. So that's our funded ADA. And we don't think our current ADA is going to surpass that, so our funded ADA is currently still essentially the same as last year. Now, when we get to this year, that's the green circle and the gray bar, if you look at 21 22. When we budgeted in June, we were using about a 96% attendance rate for the attempt, for the enrollment that we expected or we projected in June. So the ADA that's reported in the gray bar is the ADA we reported in the budget in June. You can see that's about 8,721 ADA. Right now, using a nine, using current enrollment and projecting what the ADA we had a 95% ADA mark. We'd be about 87.25. So you can see we're up about five, about four to 88 over June, even though we made 125 kids. That's because we're losing it. We don't have the 88 that we did that we showed in the past, especially in 1920. Hey, Rob. So just one of the things, because this is a, a common thing that's happening uh, to districts across the state right now, is because of the guidance around COVID in terms of quarantine, because of um, more families staying home and having to stay home even when they have symptoms, we're seeing our attendance go down quite a bit. So that average daily attendance, it's, it's a consistent metric that we're seeing that's happening across the state. And there are discussions at the state level to look at some sort of full harmless or average over years because it's um, because we're just complying with uh, the guidance that's there, but it will be something that we'll continue to hear about as we go forward. Thank you. So when, I, when we do the LCF calculator for the first interim, we're looking at right now these are the numbers, these are the graph numbers that we would be looking at, which is the, the, the two green circles. So you can see that ADA is going up, and you can see in 2023, we're about 100 kids higher, because we're projecting about 188 growth over where we currently are. What we'll have to watch this year, which will be really more important second interim than the budget time, is will our ADA improve or, or what do we actually do for the outbreak? Because when we go to Fleming next year, which is the 2023 school year, they look at the current year or the last year. So you can see the green bar in 2023, 88.25 is higher than 87.25. So we'll fund on the 22.23 ADA. What we have to look at is what will that ADA, what do we actually have to project that ADA when we do budget development? Now, we can come up with lots of things, and, and you know, we hope that the legislature will give us some relief and we don't have to get way out of the limb. But 
But the issue that we have is we actually report our ADA. The ADA is officially reported to the county as part of our budget package. And the county auditors and our auditor will look at our current ADA and look at what we project and will we'll actually call us out if we are getting too far out in terms of how we're projecting our ADA. So I'm just showing you that, that what we're going through and paying attention to where we are in ADA, which is why I'm really bringing the information. Here's what's here's what we do, here's what's real. And we know that our enrollment's growing. So if our enrollment was flat, we'd be having a much different conversation relative to the average. But we know we're having growth. So that's going to help a little bit. But we need to watch our enrollment over the next part of the year, over the next couple of months, as we go through first and second interim, and as we start to do budget develop. And I'll talk a little later about some of the other things that come along. So it's just it's a hard, it's a hard topic to cover in a very short period of time. I'm just highlighting a couple of things that we're watching and we'll continue to keep the board appraised of what's going on and how this is working. So, and, 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 and the other way to look at that is, is we're funded on EA, and the bottom line, which is what they realize, which is what we actually offer our budget on, is these are the people on that. So, kindergarten through third grade get about $8,900 a kid, four through six, 82, seven through eight, 8400. You know, and that's for 92 kids, that's about $795,000. So that's our fixed revenue for this year based on our on last year's ADA. And as next year, you can see we have there's total built into the budget already, but those numbers will increase a little bit next year, and those were already built into the multi year and we got them into. In summary, enrollment's up. We're still about 150 short of where we were in 1920 for enrollment. You saw that ADA is down slower than used to, but this is um, data that talked about, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. That's something we also have to monitor as we move through this pandemic and work through the things that we're doing to make sure kids are safe and our community is safe, those things might change. Um, we're still, this year, still funded at last year's ADA, so that's a whole harmless cause, and we also have that. Next year, we'll be funded on the actual, which is something I talked about, like a little summer year, and we'll, we'll fund on whichever is higher of the two. And we also need to watch our UPP, which is our MPPK account. As we have, um, as you're all aware, we're providing like free lunch to all students, so there's a, the incentive for some of our parents to fill out the previous lunch application isn't there. They don't qualify for a lot of other things, so there's no reason to fill out an application. And I don't blame them, we understand that. But when they don't fill out the application, it doesn't, we don't get those accounts for us, so we're working on reaching out to the community now to at least provide us with their their household income so we can we can collect that information in a, in a confidential manner through food services and report that. At this time we're about 100 to 150 kids below where we were last year, which is below where we would be before. So we'll affect our budget slightly. Welcome on for that. This is one of the things the legislature are talking about giving us a whole terms. The one catch on legislative talk is they don't come back to session until January. And after the January revise or the January budget we the governor. So we work for a couple of months with, with really backing outside of just the rumors of what the legislature is talking about. Looking at one-time funding, so changing the course just a little bit. If, I'll take a step pause. If there's a board member, do the board members have any questions on ADA at all? Okay. One-time funding. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to walk through some of the funding sources we have to give you a picture and review what's going on. Um, since really 12 months ago or 18 months ago, uh, state legislature has provided 17 new pots of money coming to school districts. And, and for us, that's a 27% change in funding sources relative to the number of funding sources we currently have. Most of those are one time, and they are both a mixture of state and federal resources. And they've been legislated over the last 20 months, starting in the spring of 2020. We got additional money in the budget for 2021. The federal and state came up with more money during the year, and we got more one time money in the 2021, 21, 22 budget. On the federal side, there's 10 budget, 10 funding sources that we received. And on the state side, there's six or seven. Um, the newest one, the seven the bottom, just got released um, just a couple of weeks ago. We're, we're getting that into the budget now for use. All of these, except for number seven, all of these were actually allocated and projected in our June budget when we talked about the June total budget allocation in June. Looking at the state funding, there's an educator effective law grant that was part of the state legislation that they only adopted the budget, 
the treasurer bill came on each came through the state state department of ed and the department of finance finally released those funds just two weeks ago so we're still getting those in the budget and that's in and on all these slides i'm giving you the dollar amount that's allocated to us as well as the resource which is the funding code that goes into our funding sources and these were included in the 2021 22 budget guidance on funding allocation was actually released to us in november we have five, so it's one timeline, but we have five years to spend it. Uh, provide professional learning and promote educator equity effectiveness. Um, there's actually 10 categories of funding, and I'm not going to steal Michael's thunder. He's going to talk in much greater detail about this, this actual funding source tonight. Follow me. Um, and then the plan is required, which is why Michael's in front of you tonight. We have to have a plan approved by December 31st. And I'll note that the legislature, the state, Department of Ed released this funding to us just at the beginning of this month. So we're working in scrambling to get those things up and, and present it to you. Another state funding is, is something with Senate Bill 117, which has actually occurred right when the pandemic that was all the way back in March 2020, about $156,000. Really, they got that out to us to start to address some of the, the things we needed for PPE and to, get, to, get our, to address some of the things right there as we were in the pandemic. Um, another source, which was the CARE CRF, that was a resource 7420, about $660,000. Again, that was money that came to us in March 20. This is state funding, um, and that had to be extended by 63021, so that was included in the budget report that we provided in June. Um, and that was an activity to directly supporting people after achievement and mitigating the learning loss in, in the things and school workers. Another funding source, 7422, in person instruction. If you remember, we received this in March of 2021. We actually didn't get the resources really until May. And this was really to help us and support school districts in opening up our schools and getting in person instruction back in place. Um, and then in the 21 22 state budget, um, the budget adopted some expenditure dates and extended those a little bit further out. So we have until September 30th, 2024, to extend those dollars. State funding and other expanded learning resources. This came out, these fundings came out basically the same time this one did. And this was really for to do expanded learning, um, one for uh, really extended learning and intervention services, as well as provide um, some direct funding very specifically targeted to um, parents or um, paraprofessionals. About $4.9 million for 7425, about $541,000 uh, $541, for the para resources and combined. It was just over five million dollars. Um, that, had a, that has an expenditure deadline now of uh, September 24. Again, that was, that was extended um, in this current legislative package. Um, the, the one thing that I'll point out there is in the 21-22 budget, the state and the trailer bill language reduced the dollar amounts that was, that was provided to us in these resources and moved that into some federal resources, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the funding we receive is the same, where we have the cost of money we get. So what happens in most districts is we had a lot of that budget and allocated, and all of a sudden it wasn't there again. So we had to reduce those budget, move those expenditures over to where the money moved. So um, kudos to my accounting department, especially most of Guzman, for tracking that and keeping those all in place. Um, moving on to federal funds, you remember the Corona Rise Relief Fund, that was the first pot of money that came out to us in June of 2020. We had all day of this year uh, to extend it, uh, $3.9 million. Um, and again, that was reported and we extended those dollars um, on time by May 21. SO1, there are several lessons to talk about. The first one is uh, Resource 3210. This was a March 2020 allocation. Um, we have until uh, this September, or I'm sorry, next September, to extend those dollars about five hundred thousand dollars. And there's nine categories of um, expenditures. The the one that's most interesting that the, the, the legislators put in to give school districts some, some possibility is other activities to continue school operations and employment of existing staff. So that sort of gives districts a lot of flexibility to do that. But as we, as we talked about in, some, in our two-year plan, which I'll point out in just a little bit, is that there's many things, there's prevention services, um, and there's some teachers we're looking at, trainings, um, mental health services, technology, and we're also using these SRFs to, to purchase and support. SR2, 
Um, one of the resources is 3212, about $1.9 million. That was allocated in April of 2020. Um, we have till um, September of 2022 to spend those. Um, we also received some SR2 state money. These are some of the money that got swapped for this, the, some of the state money we received. We, we got those, we just received that funding because of the legislation in September of 2021. Um, replaced part of resource 7424. And you can see the SR expenditure rules are the same as SR1. We have some flexibility for that. SR3. Um, the first time money we received um, actually in December, um, our, the previous president signed that bill and we received those funds. That was 3213, about $3.5 million. Then there's other three other SF3 three pots, um, some that came through federal legislation. When, that, when this, the federal government provided these federal dollars to the states, it went to the cap, it went to the Department of Education, so the state legislature. So some of that was earmarked directly to schools, which we received, and some of it was earmarked to the state. The state legislature and the governor then reallocated some of those funds back to the schools. So that's the bottom three. This earning loss of the, the resource 3214, 3218, and 3219 are reallocations to the state level back to the schools in addition to what we got directly from the feds. And so you can see all of those have a due date or expenditure date of, of 23 to 24, depending on when we got the funding and where it was coming from. And you can see, I, I, I know if you're 30, the last three were part of the replacements of the money that was uh, swapped out for 74.5. And again, the same has to call it uh, expenditure categories as those were one and two. There's more federal funds. There was two gear accounts. These are, uh, uh, Governor's Educator Education Relief, um, Emergency Education Emergency Relief, I think is what it's called. So there's a 3215, which we received back in March of 2020, and then there was additional money that got allocated as part of the state budget this year. Um, we finally got out about in September, and that's resource 3017. You can see about 630 last year, and another 184,000 this year. Um, few dates of, or expenditure dates of September 22nd and September 23rd. These, these expenditure categories are a little different than SF3 because they're technically allocated to the governor's um, office. So there's a couple of different rules. We don't have quite the number of flexibility. It's one of the things that we pay attention to in how we, how we use those funds. There's also year two, just to remind you, that's just tier one. In year two, this resource 3217 uh, looks like I repeated it, and you can see the expenditure categories there are the same. Now, we presented a plan um, back in May, and we brought to you in June. It was called the Learning Intervention Plan, um, and it did include the projected SF3 funding. So, all the funding you've seen, except for the, the two that came out of the state legislation. Um, which is the professional level block grant as well as the extended learning grant, which we haven't covered yet. These all were included in the dollar amounts that we talked about and projected in our three year plan. That three year plan looked at state funds, but which we had to extend by June 21st, June 2021, and then we had some, and then we had a state adopted budget that provided more money. And in that plan, the three year plan, we talked about intervention teachers, counselors, summer school, intercession, online school, before and after school intervention, professional development, and input supply, all those were included in the plan. And even though the governor and the legislature mixed and matched and increased the pots of money, we had that plan is still in place. We still have a two year plan. And we'll be talking all about some more information on specifics in terms of the expenditures and the budget allocations when we come back at our first interim next month. But just to know that that plan is still in place. And, and, and again, just to reiterate, the intervention teachers are still remember the plan was two years of intervention, two years of counselors, two years of paraprofessionals. So those, those services are still continued in the budget through next year through the use of these one-time money weapons for review. And then in summer school, intercession, online tools, before and after school eviction, professional development, was all those professional development activities continue, as well as many of the other one-time money that we talked about. When you look at it from my standpoint, when I look at that, when I look at it this way, and I know that's hard to read, is this looks like the 2021 budget. We can talk about what it shows here is what was actually budgeted in 2021. We had about $11.8 million. And in 2021, through all the different actions we took, we spent about $7.5 million. In 2021, 22, 
And again, that was covered in our budget uh, adoption in two. In 21 22, you can see that we have about 16, 16 just over $16 million still allocated in one line. And you can see that there's two additional block grants right in the middle that are included in that. And you can see there's still plans to spend some of that, and some of that still needs to be put into place in terms of how we fulfill it in next year. This is just looking at this year. One of the factors that affects us from a county standpoint is the state took up the federal rules is when they receive the funding, we have to budget the funding. I can't put it in a reserve account and not show the budget. It actually has to show. So I have to take all those funds, put it in the budget, and show it as an expenditure. At the end of the year, if I don't spend it all, I get to roll over the next year and I have to do accounting work um, next to Melissa that moves that money to next year. So it looks a little like we have a $10 million we have to spend. Much of that is budgeted, but much of it's going to be earmarked for next year because we have those the counselors and the interventions to roll in next year, we have some some um, some other issues that we're going to address with that sustaining over this year and next year that we'll up those funds. One time implications again, there are 16 or 17 new funding sources. Um, we are pleading, all, all voices are pleading with the governor and the legislature, please, no, no more new funding, please put it into the base, give us base money, let the districts have some flexibility in how we use the funds to support the types of things that we want to do every day. Um, and, and with those, there's rules and regulations we have to pay attention to, and reporting timelines and rules and regulations. These funds are on time. They have to be used for uh, like a range of activities, um, one-time expenditures. If we use these for ongoing expenditures, which we talked about, so the counselors, the intervention teachers, and the paraprofessionals, those are ongoing expenditures that we talked about from the beginning when this one-time money goes away. So do those positions and, and, and the funding that goes along with us. And there are services, there's staffing, there's, there's contracts as well, all built into those that we plan to do over two years. And we'll be looking at that much closer in November as we work through the spring. So when we look at that, and one of the things that, that, that I look at and that I work really hard on uh, with my staff and communicating with cabinet principals is looking at some, some of the funds and what they can be used for. We have to look at those activities that continue the school operations and employment of existing staff. And when we look at using some of that, which we talked about in June, to offset that to spending, we can use those for unrestricted expenditures. What that does is it, it reduces our debt to spending, so we know that we're spending more money than we have on the unrestricted side, so we can move some of those unrestricted expenditures to the restricted side into a one time money. That works for a very short period of time. What it does is it increases our ending balance, which means that we have a balanced budget for the Senate the county, and we'll have to look at that practice probably next year. But what it does is those one time expenditures, let's say that we use it for transportation fees or we use it for utilities, we have to bring those utility costs and those transportation fees back to the unrestricted budget next year. If we use it, if we pay for the district, we have to bring those back into the unrestricted budget. So once I pay for them, then I have to remember to bring them back. So one of the things we look at is looking at what are some of the bigger ticket items that we can pay down with one-time money to give us flexibility and our unrestricted and keep us solid in doing all the planning and the, and the projects that we want to do. So I, I, I sort of paraphrase some of the things, but it's, it's, it's something we spend a lot of time on. And it's something that we also monitor that we're going to use so to make sure that those expenditures come back and we're monitoring those in our multi year budget. Thinking about that, we'll be talking about that a little more specifically when we're at first in our two. The adopted budget did include some other funding that will be recognized at first in our. Um, we talked about it before special education revenue increased a little bit. Um, and we also got some um, one time funding, special ed relative to mitigate the learning losses and some of the um, as, we, as we address um, one, schools being closed, and two, address um, just some of the services that we are providing so that we have some funding to sort of help address some of those, those, those losses. The second thing is there's some additional ongoing special ed funding in the base that was provided that we've included in the budget um, that's important to monitor. We've also had new costs. So we've also realized additional expenditures um, following the adoption. Um, as you know, we've, we've opened the alternative education school program. So when we started the, the when we ended the summer and we got to the budget in June, we had a small alternative education staff and we staffed our sites with our projected enrollment. 
as we've opened up alternative ed and those kids have moved from our school sites or we've gained some back in the community, we've moved teachers from our school sites and replaced them with new teachers. <coughs> and so those have really been additional teachers to our, our, our budget as we work through the year. So those are additional costs that we've incurred. And we also know the special ed commission's costs have increased. Um, we have those one-time needs that we're addressing with one-time money. Uh, although the one-time needs we have clearly outpaced the one-time money we receive. And number two, we, we've added staff. Because remember, we talked about when we were in COVID and we were, um, when our schools were closed, we were back in hybrid, we didn't have all those students back in class. And we didn't have some of our one one eight. We had open positions we didn't fill. As all those students have come back to our campuses, we've had to fill all those positions and refill those to come back. So we've had some, we've had increases in, in special ed costs. And at this time, today, that may change by tomorrow, our contribution to special ed is not going to be increasing for sure. Um, that's, a, that's a status I'll take today, and that's all it's subject to change. I know most of you to learn I'm not going to pick on it, but it's a reality of serving our students. Just a reminder that we did. We did have all the increases um, in the, 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 the legislature that got approved for the, for the 21 22 budget did about 5% total this year, and 2.48 for next year, and 3.11 for the following year. That's what that we knew that in June, and we adopted the budget in June that, and we made some, um, some sound agreements with our, our bargaining units that knowing those things relative to our own people. Those haven't changed, but there are some rumors that we saw the legislative analyst report today or, or the legislative analyst came out today. Um, that was very positive. Um, until the government actually says it out loud that the government that the legislature got that, but we all know what the, the stock market's doing, so we know that the, the, the health of our economy is positive, and we can look forward to that. First interim coming up, first interim budget will be presented to you on the 15th for adoption. We'll be talking again and watching very closely ADA attendance, um, our undue community account, our one-time money, our multi-year projections. We have to current do this year, or the next year, two years, and make sure our rating balance is positive. And then we'll also, by the time we come to the second interim, in between now, in between first interim of December and our second interim in March, the governor will release his January budget, and then all of us will start over. We know the economy looks sound. Um, we do need ongoing funding, so that voice is being heard from lots of different sources. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ten point three is an update on the school board educator affected in this grant. Take away from Good evening, Board of Education. So, Robin touched on this um, a little bit, and the purpose of presenting tonight is this is required for the approval of the expenditures of these um, funds. No way. Yeah. All right. So there's some working assumptions that we're um, utilizing in terms of this um, this plan, and these are important as we look at how we're um, proposing to, to spend these funds. The first thing, and Robin talked about this, is that this is one slice of that those 17 pot, those 17 different areas of money. It's just one part, and it can only be spent on professional learning. That's the only area that this can be spent on. We also know that this is a plan for five years. We don't profess to know what we think we're going to need five years from now, and so we know that things will change, and that that will be guided by data collection and um, some other groups that will help inform us. Those groups primarily are our curriculum and instruction leadership team, which is made up of uh, mostly of teachers with some administrators as well, a strategic action planning committee, which begins doing its work after the new year, and we'll make um, decisions around our LCAP and our principal's council. We also, in this plan, you'll see a balance between some site offerings, site allocations of money, and district from the district perspective. And we think we've developed a, a plan that 
addresses the most critical areas and spans all five of the universe. Okay. This is from Robin's presentation, just a reminder that um, it, it, a key here is that this was just released in, 11, in November, the guidance around this in November of this year. So you will see some things in the plan that were not expenditures for this past summer because we didn't have those rules and regulations that we'll be looking at for next summer. So this is the plan requirements, basically my presentation tonight, and then I will be back before December 30th, so our next board meeting to adopt the plan. This is just a slide that gives sort of an overview of some of the areas of professional development that are seen in our plan. There are a couple of others that I um, that didn't make it into the slide presentation, but that I um, are part of the plan. So I wanted to highlight those. There is um, Excuse me, I'm jumping my head around. This is the, um, these are all the areas that we presented to you as areas that we were going to spend our educator effectiveness. All of our, we are kind of on. And the one that's highlighted is the yellow one that is um, the uh, educator effectiveness. This is included in your um, in your material, so it will be easier to read. But there are ten areas of professional learning that we can spend the funds on. They're pretty inclusive. They allow us a lot of leeway. They are things that we are included in our health anyways, and are areas that we would address um, normally. So it's, it was difficult for us to find ways to allocate this money because there are things that we would do anyways. There is only one area that we did not put any funding in, and that's because it doesn't apply to us, and that's um, number nine around ethnic studies, which is um, for pupil instruction for grades and IQ. So this is the slide that shows some of our plan components. So we do have an, arson, an allocation for new teacher trainings. Um, this is particularly important right now when a lot of our new teachers have come to us without the typical student teaching experience that they would have had in the past. We also have teachers whose first year of teaching was in distance learning, and so therefore have not taught in person uh, very much, and so that's an important component. Um, a CNI summer institute, so as much training as we can do over the summer to um, build people's background and, and provide professional learning. As I said, we did get some money for site allocations for areas of need for, for sites to determine, some curriculum, excuse me, committee articulation meetings, after school trainings, math training. Foundational reading skills, which is our skills for our early readers in TK through um, second grade. The BioSync um, program that, that um, is being rolled out by HR and um, Student Services and the EL Institute. I did not include those into the whole plan. I apologize for that. Maybe you do have it in your materials. This is just an example of some of the things that we're pro providing in after school um, professional development um, for teachers and allows us, this one kind of money allows us to pay teachers to attend after school, which is um, somewhat of a, of a I don't know what's the word, a good thing that we haven't always had in the past. And these are being put on by our instructional coaches and, and, and our range of um, topics that will continue throughout the year. This is just a, um, a smattering. This is not everything we're doing. So what feedback do you have for me on our draft plan? I think you've been very thorough at this point. Go forward to some of the other things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, we have the whole plan in our material. Yes, it's that, um, so it doesn't come up very very well in here. Um, 
but it looks like it's this guy here. Okay, with all the, so this has the 10 areas and the amount allocated in each, in each area for the five years. Okay. Michael, you pointed out one of the nine slide. There's no money in it because we don't, uh, we're not required to teach it. Is that the uh, CRT? Is that the one we're saying? It's not the same as CRT. It, it, it is really the, the high school ethnic studies program that they do, and we're not. We, we don't provide that, and it's not a requirement for this. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. What is the L Institute? Oh, EL, yeah, English Learners. So for our teachers teaching English learners, it's maybe three, so I cannot articulate in that. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, and thank you for the details of this uh, plan. Do you want to draw the attention to the funding application? And I have a couple of questions on that. Um, Thank you for sharing more about the Salmon Institute and that um, based on the school year that you guys will assess, you know, what type of trainings will be available to the teachers. I'm just curious, what type of data and or measure would we be using to identify what trainings will be offered to the teachers? Yeah, so um, right now, most of our trainings are tied to our LCAP. We look at our um, student data which has been hampered due to the distance learning, but we do have to push, um, me, language arts data around reading. Um, so looking at that data and, and considering what areas of need within reading or math, because we do have some math data that we can look at to um, provide the training. Um, I know that the last, uh, State assessment test and the data that we have is from the year 18, 19. Right. Um, can someone remind me when is the are we, are we testing this year or yes. next year? So this year. So will those that mm -hmm. data be used? Yes. Okay. Yes. We will be testing in um, late April or early May, and it is um, it is a shortened test, but it is supposed to be around and give us the data that we have in the past. But we will have the data before we're doing summer programs. We will not have the we right. We, they always promise it really fast. They never give it to us fast. Um, so will we be leveraging um, the 1819 data to support what we're going to be doing for the summer? Just coming up here. Yeah, it's, it's too old and irrelevant for, for us at this point. We use other multiple measures that we have within the house. Okay, seems okay. Um, related to Section 2, which is the program that leads to effective standards, aligned instruction, and improved instruction and literacy across all subjects. Right. I do have a couple of questions related to the planned activities. And so the math training, can you talk a little bit about what that consists of? Yeah, so it would be a continuation of some of the things that we have been doing. We've been doing uh, math training um, around some, some strategies in the elementary level, that's number blocks. And um, at, the, at the middle school level, it's routines for reasoning, which is a strategy for engaging students in, in looking at and talking about math. So those would be some of the things. We also know um, number sense is a big, a big student need and a big basis for student understanding throughout the grades. And so number sense would be another part of it. Okay. Are these consistent with the areas in the state testing exam? Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. And then I do see that with the math training, it looks like um, we are 50,000 next year and it kind of cheated off 20,000 for the, the following years. Um, any particular reason why? Just getting a good jump start on it and trying to, trying to balance that over the years. Those are, uh, Stephanie, I would always really say those are, you know, guesstimate numbers, but we, we like to get it hard and then do follow up. And um, you, you touched on this, and I appreciate the foundation reading skills training. That's 
geared towards um, was that TK or K through third or maybe second grade? Yeah, roughly TK through second, although it does span the third depending on student needs, and it's really around uh, the foundational reading skills of phonemics, phonetical, phonics, phonemic awareness, and it gets into things like fluency later on in second grade, letter sounds. So it's the science of reading. Okay. And that it's really foundational. I'm just curious, you know, I see the, the amount is 10K. Can you tell me what type of training that would consist of for 10K? Yeah, we've already started to do some of that. We had just this last week our, um, some of our newer teachers in to just get the fits with the other category, but to build their background knowledge around early reading and those foundational skills. Um, so we're going to continue to offer those, those sorts of offerings to make sure um, it has a good solid understanding for okay. Sorry, I'm going to take up all the questions, but this is uh, uh, very interesting stuff, and I appreciate you taking the time sure. to answer these questions for me. Um, related to um, after school training, you talk about that, and um, you talked a little bit about what the training consists of, um, and will there be opportunity to adjust the funding for this as we see fit for the needs of our students and teachers? Absolutely, yeah. And that's where that, that um, this slide here Stephanie comes in by on this topic, yes. But just having that input from right there, that fourth bullet from our curriculum instruction leadership team, which is that group that's mostly made up of. Um, teachers and um, then those uh, other groups in the general. On that note, how are those individuals selected to serve on that? Uh, for, for curriculum instruction leadership team, it's an application process. Okay. And do we, does the district solicit? Or what, what the yeah, we do a posting mm -hmm. and then we, um, I actually work with um, our union president to select those. those Maybe see the site for the participation. Two more. Site allocations. How are those going to be divvied up? They're divvied up based on um, the size of school and um, other other sorts of demographics. So it's a it's sort of a per, per pupil allocation. Okay. So we we think that the funding that you allocated here. Will be enough to divvy up between the sites that we have? Yeah, we actually think that it might be more than they can spend in a given year. And how are we going to power this? Are we doing that on the last in advance, or how are we engaging that? Uh, that's with, I've been doing that with working with the principals on, on, uh, through that principal council structure and, and um, in making sure that they are using that funds. Um, they, 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 they have a wide range of areas they can use it for, and um, so they don't think that they, they they don't think that they would do all our sites. They don't think that they would use what I'm seeing here as twenty two thousand to support the students uh, in the divided by our district. By our no, the map because it's in five or six categories. So the, that site allocation piece, like, again, this is really hard to see here. But it's in, they each, let, let me just summarize by saying this each site received somewhere in the neighborhood of between 25 and 35 pounds okay. The total site allocation for, for sites is $300,000 each year. Okay, so the 22500 is per site? But no, the, um, I wish I could see it better, Stephanie, but there are five areas up there that say site allocation. And I'm talking specifically about section two, the program that we still have this name. Oh, you're specifically referring to section two. Okay. I was I was speaking the cumulative amount that they see. Yeah, no, I think that's a good amount for that specific area. Okay. Um, so when you come back in December, will we be able to kind of share what we think the expected outcomes would be based on these trainings? Sure. Thank you. That's all I have. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, for number 10, you were talking about uh, funding for uh, early childhood education. Is, are there any plans in the 
works to uh, move to full day kindergarten instead of half day? There are no plans that I have been involved in. That is not something we've talked about up to this point. Any other questions? Comment. When I look at the state testing and I look at the scores of our students and those that have met the standard and those that have not, I do see that there is definitely an opportunity around reading. And so I know we have a foundational reading skills. Um, but I encourage the, the district and the school and the different um, school sites to really look at how we can improve our reading comprehension in the different areas within that. Um, so that way we can see an increased, um, increased rate of students that are leaving that particular reading area. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I would just um, remind that we had allocated over a million dollars for intervention teachers that are working on that very thing um, in reading comprehension and other areas of reading. That's another way of addressing that. That will be part of the, some of the examples we'll be able to bring in December. Well, the, the reading intervention money is not part of this education. Ed, educators of that. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it is another one of the one time pots and money that we're spending towards that purpose. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Well, that was just an information item uh, the COVID 19 funding. Sure. That is me. So, just a, a, a quick regular update on what's taken place in terms of COVID around. Um, since we met last time on November 2nd, the Pfizer vaccine uh, received uh, emergency usage approval for high 11 year olds, and there are vaccines currently available. Uh, in, in many different places uh, for those uh, those ages. Um, from the state, um, just as uh, you heard earlier from, from some of the speakers, is that what we're hearing is that the vaccine mandate, it's very unlikely that it would go into place before uh, the start of the 22-23 school year. Um, there's still a lot of things to take place before um, that's finalized. So you should expect in January to start seeing legislation discussion around that and, and what might take place. Um, this is a little confusing right now. There are some mixed messages that are out there. Boosters are being recommended for those over 18. Um, they've been available for specific groups six months after Pfizer and Moderna and two months after uh, J and J. Um, actually, I think they're available for everybody for, for J and J, but the Pfizer the better one is in some categories, but uh, the state is telling people to relax those and let anybody over 18 get those, and they're starting to encourage those. We are holding um, a vaccination clinic uh, for families in our area. Um, they don't have to be uh, children at our school. This, uh, the, the two first days will be on November 15th and November 19th. These will be at any Hill Middle School. This is where we were having our daily uh, COVID testing as well, which is taking place before we move this um, to different school sites. Um, and so they will be scheduling that. This is a partnership with La Clinica, um, the Contra Costa Health Services. So we're not providing it, um, we're just providing the space for them to be able to do that. Just in terms of an update in numbers, um, it continues to see, uh, this is a quote from today, so this is yesterday's data. Consider, continue to see a plateau um, in terms of positives not going significantly up or down in the area. Um, this is another way of looking at it from the vaccinated and unvaccinated populations um, within the county itself. This is by age, so this is looking at um, uh, the number of new cases per 100,000 residents by age um, so over the last uh, 30 days. I think one of the things that's important to note is the five to 12 year olds um, continue to be the longest ones with the health, but the, having the most um, positive cases over the last 30 days. What the health department has been saying is they don't necessarily think that that's reflective of them having the most cases of COVID, but the fact that they're being tested more because of school requirements and so forth, that that's happening, that they are seeing more positive COVID. Um, I 
been showing you this chart, um, and all of this you can pull off the health department website in terms of the number of, of new cases that's specific to cities. And so back in August, it was 427. It got all the way down to 102 over a 14 day period uh, in October. Uh, it has picked up a little bit um, to 124 um, as of yesterday, um, but it's still significantly less, less than where we were in August. Um, what is true is that hospitalizations have continued to trend down and trend lower uh, in the area, so that's a positive sign. And then this is just a quick reminder that uh, because we get lots of questions on the indoor mask mandate, now remember this isn't schools. Schools are governed largely our mask mandates from the California Department of Public Health, but this is a contra cost that uh, County Health Department does impact businesses in, in our area. So in order to uh, for the mask mandate to be lifted in contra cost County indoors, there's three criteria that have to be met. So the first one is we have to be in the yellow range. So right now um, we continue to be in the orange, so that's basically the low X. We're not meeting that. The health department has been saying that they think that we are going to follow to the yellow. Um, they don't know how the recent rise in cases impacts that, but we have been hearing that. There has to be less than 75 um, cases of hospitalization due to COVID in the area. We are meeting that, and that's not significantly. I think in November that number was 50. So you can see that number going down, which is a positive sign. And then the other piece is even if eight percent of the total population of Contra County must be fully vaccinated, or it has to be um, eight weeks after that emergency use authorization for five to eleven year olds. And so we're now we're two weeks out from that. So assuming that Contra County prediction of us being in yellow um, in the near future is met. Um, the earliest that the vaccine or the mask mandate could be uh, listed in terms of community in our schools uh, is December 29th, I believe is the date. So, uh, anyway, just want to pass that on. Hey, I'm sorry, that's the least since um, it's been two weeks since it was authorized for the 5 11, so it's eight, six more weeks. Thank you. Sorry. Just a reminder that on our, right on our front page, there's a whole section of COVID resources that has lots of information. This is the dashboard that uh, we continue to do and provide each week on, on Monday. So we've seen our uh, positive cases uh, go down quite a bit. It's not really positive, and it shows uh, my month as well. And if you go on that site, all the other data is there for the rest of the year. So just want to get back to the front page. Any questions? Again, that was an informational item. 10.5, another informational item is the change in the governor's late start bill. Yeah, I, I wanted to just update the board on this. This isn't, it, it doesn't affect us significantly, um, but just for clarity, SB uh, 328, which was uh, by Senator Portino um, a couple years ago, uh, was passed in 2019. And basically what it requires is that uh, all middle schools can't, they have to begin no earlier than 8 a.m. All high schools have to begin no earlier than 8.30 a.m. So the impact, that you, and that's going to start July 1st, 2022. So there was a three-year lead-up process to that. So next school year, all the schools in California will have to meet these guidelines. For us, I've listed the start time for our schools. So the only one that doesn't need it currently is Adams Middle School, which starts at 755. So that's a five minute adjustment. It's not a big deal. First school is 825, um, and then it goes 817. Where this could get interesting is we're part of a transportation consortium. And this is a significant change for high schools. And so because we're part of a transportation consortium, the bus schedules are pretty intricate in terms of getting elementary kids and getting high school kids and then doing all of those things to make it work. And so there could be collateral change that's required in our starting schedules as a result. So um, Lauren Briggs is well aware of the, of the change that needs to be made and we'll be talking about that as we go forward. But it's, it's even possible that, um, you know, Bristol, for example, or Edinburgh might have to change and move back a little bit or an elementary school might have to change to really accommodate the transportation houses to go forward. 
So anyway, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. It's something that I'm sure we'll be talking about in the transportation committee as we, as we move towards this. How about zero period? That's a good question. So zero period, it's not a period where um, kids are required to attend and it doesn't happen. So that's so band, for example, can still be before. And we do have some PE classes that are still zero period to allow for students to take different classes along the way. So that still shouldn't be a problem provided the transportation can work out. So in that case. Thank you. Yeah. Moving along, another informational item is the update on professional development. Good evening again. Robin is calling that out for us. Thank you, Robin. So, this is an uh, item requested by um, the board at the last the board meeting, and I wanted to give you a little update on our um, science and social studies in regards to uh, professional development. So this, I believe, is the um, document from the, um, that I presented last time that um, gave rise to this uh, presentation tonight. As you can see, and these are, I, I want to be clear that, that these scores were scored by me. They are an honest, if not um, quite critical, evaluation of where where we're at in some of our implementation. On the left side is all around um, professional development, and on the right side is the um, scoring of adopt, implementing adopted state curriculum. So you can see that I scored our science and social studies um, lower than the other areas um, in both categories. So, so let's talk about science first and professional development in the curriculum and where we're at. And I, I, I'm just going to go back for a half second and say that um, it's important for me to know, note, and you will see this as I present, that if I were scoring elementary separate from middle school, the scores would be different for each of them. And I did not average. I took the lower. So if we're not really there in one of those two, I, I would put the lower score. I went the wrong way, didn't I? I had a tendency to do that, obviously. All right, so in terms of professional learning, some of the things that we've done in the last several years, um, for elementary, um, prior to COVID, we did some what we call NGSS, the, the um, uh, Next Generation Science Standards Roadshows, where we talked about what was it, what was coming in science, what were those instructional shifts, and how were teachers to approach those instructional shifts, we formed a committee where we put together a plan, which we call our implementation plan, and that exists for both elementary and middle. We've done some training on mystery science, which is our current utilized um, science program at the elementary level. It has many things that are aligned to the next generation science standards. It's not state adopted. Um, which is not a requirement for us to use a state adopted program, um, but it is the program we're currently using, and it is generally from, from my talking to teachers and, and surveys we've done well liked and well, well um, utilized. We also did some training in how to create strong explanation of a scientific phenomena, because that's a key, uh, starting with phenomena is a key. Uh, um, instructional strategy in the next generation science standards. This um, particular focus was based on some survey and teacher needs. And we had our uh, a science subcommittee participate in some town workshops around the next generation implementation. At the middle school level, we, um, we also have that plan, but um, a little bit more extensive here based on where we're at. So we did a full five-day NGSS course um, and numerous CLT days focused on the framework and instruction. We had teams of teachers participating in the California Department of Education rollout symposium, and we started the process for adoption, which I'll talk about a little bit more. 
So for elementary with our adopted programs, we began piloting in 1920 and had to pause due to COVID. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more as to why in just a minute. We will resume this as soon as we have enough subs. This is not a process that we can do through Zoom. It would not be effective. It, it's, it's too, it requires too much pulling teams of teachers together, looking at materials together, rating those materials, talking about those materials, implementing those materials, and it's just not something that we feel we can um, validly do over Zoom. I mentioned that we're currently using a robust program called District Science. At the middle school level, we um, we started the process of our adoption in 1819. We chose STEM scopes in 1920, and we had the um, uh, little sarcasm here, the great pleasure of implementing it during um, distance learning, which actually turned out to be not, not too horrible, but it's not ideal. In terms of social studies, we have done some work, uh, just started some work actually in elementary around diversifying the work historical narrative. This is a work group that's, that's meeting and trying to move this work forward. And um, we recently also shared some new some materials for that can be used by teachers at this time in the year around. Native peoples and harvest, harvest tradition. Um, we'll try to bring up to date some of the typical Thanksgiving materials that happen right now. At the middle school level, we um, started a partnership um, that we maintained for a few years with the University of California History Social Studies Project. And then we have been doing trainings interspersed and working with our um, history leads on the new state framework. And and historical thinking skills, which is such a big part of the new, um, the new components of the framework. And then in the last couple of years, we've started that focus in the Fair Act and diversifying that. <coughs> this is where we're at the social studies curriculum adoption. We plan to pilot in 2023-2024 and implement the following year. And we plan to pilot it at middle school starting in just a few months, hoping to select the program next year and implement the year after that. It takes about 18 months to go through the implementation process or the selection process of a new program. So that kind of gives you that sense of, of that starting in June. A couple of um, highlights as to why we are at this point. Um, one is that distance learning and COVID did set us back on this work. Um, funding has been um, not currently a problem, but historically a problem. And any one of these five things can set us back. They're not cumulative. If we don't have subs, we can't go through the process. If we don't have the funding, we can't go through the process. So, any one of these could easily set us back in here. The other one that's important to notice, and it's sort of embedded in the overall bandwidth and limited thinking time, is that we need time to professional learn when teachers get these programs. And there is a difference between, um, between implementing programs at the elementary and the middle school level in this regard. Your typical middle school teacher teaches one content area. Some of our electives teach additional, our sixth grade teachers teach two, but many of our middle school teachers teach one content. So when we implement a program, and, and what I know about that is that when a new program is implemented, it's, it's about everything that a teacher can do in that year. They cannot be looking at other areas and trying to focus on other things at the same time. It takes that much energy and effort to learn a new program in a year. And so our middle school teachers have that, some of, at least some of them, I mean, even the sixth grade teachers only have two areas that they teach, so they can focus in on that for a year. We, would, we can't and would never implement multiple adoptions in elementary at the same time. We wouldn't even do it. The only way we do it at the middle school is if we were doing 
Suddenly, curious with the odds of land with jars and math, so that the six, it's different six grade teachers, right? So that does space out the implementation and time of our, um, of our adoptions. With that being said, um, we know we have work to do in, in elementary science, and we have a timeline for that. We know we have work to do in middle school history. That's we, we have that prioritized over the other areas because it is the most um, in need of new materials. Our, our materials there are, are um, not, not very recent, right here. Um, I do want to highlight our team that is focused on social studies and science. So we have Emily Richards, who um, is our, our uh, new teacher induction coordinator for most of our time. She um, spends one day a week, roughly, on, on history and social studies, K-8. Joe Thornhill is our um, TSA for science. He has a, about a day and a half to help us with that, and the rest of the time he teaches. And then Lizzie Barr is our coordinator for elementary programs, and Janet is our coordinator for middle school programs. So they have other things on their plate, but this is definitely part of their work as so just a kind of a quick update on where we're at. Are there any questions? Sure. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the adoption process for new social uh, studies curriculum in middle school? How does that process work? What's your criteria for selecting? And is it already narrowed down to just a couple, or how does that? Yeah, so it, it, it starts by pulling from the state list of adopted materials. That is where we start. We like to see what's on the state list. So the state adopts a set of new content materials. They have, they have a timeline. It used to be they did a new set of materials every seven years. It's been extended recently. Um, and so from there, we narrow down to two or three. We kind of do that behind the scenes, and then we bring those to a committee of teachers who look at those two or three and narrow, if it's three, they narrow down to two that they're going to pilot. At that point, that team pilots each of those for a period of time, usually around the quarter of the school year. And throughout that, they're meeting, they're getting training from the publishers and other things. Then they come back together and they use um, a pretty. It depends on the content where we pull the criteria from, but there are state sources, there are um, widely publicized sources from other um, other organizations, and it usually is a pretty pretty extensive multi-page set of criteria to go through and evaluate. And then in the end, that group of teachers um, votes for. For the adoption. So sometimes I've heard it said that um, we decide I've never had in the 11 years I've been here, I've never had a vote at all on the curriculum. It is, and, and neither are any of my people that work for me. It's all decided by teachers. Thank you. And then I, I did have a couple questions about the, the scoring that you did, but I think I'll just reach out to you all the time. Awesome. Be happy to. Yeah. Any other I'm just curious, what does um, implementation look like? Can you describe that, please? Yeah, so implementation would look like, um, it would look like it's, we have all the materials, they're in all the classrooms, and they're being, they're being utilized to fidelity to the program. Um, that's a first year, sort of, like the first year we implement. Then we want to deepen our understanding of them, get more proficient at use of them. And it, it really does take, it takes multiple years. A lot of what teachers are doing in that first year is, is a little bit of worse stuff, right? Because these programs are so comprehensive with, with what they come with. Almost in many cases too comprehensive. I think a lot of the literature think if they throw the kitchen sink in there, it will better. And it's almost too much. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a comprehensive and, and lengthy period of time. And, you know, maybe we get there at some point, but it's always a continual refinement. And then with the, the, the training, um, how do you 
how do you know that the community is effective? Or what are the things you want done that are success? Yeah, so um, I think it's a combination of teacher feedback and um, what, we're, what, what we're seeing in the classrooms. Classroom observations. And, and of course, you know, part of the data that shows students are learning and performing. Any other questions? Thank you, Mike. Mr. President, if, uh, if I may, um, would you be willing, uh, the principals that are here have seen the next presentation and there's just a few items, would you be willing to let them go if they were, if they were willing to? Um, <laughs> absolutely. Principals, you're welcome to stay. Let's go ahead and hand out Starbucks cards if you guys suffer at all. Good evening, Board. So, uh, I just want to review our IC training that's happened throughout the district. Uh, we launched, launched it just over a week ago. And so, um, so the presentation is going to be going to Roxanne and I recorded a longer slide presentation, about 10 minutes, that went out to every staff member in the district to front load them on what is IC and why are we doing IC training. Next slide. Um, I do want to review who our board members are because I think this is important, excuse me, who our members of our committee are because I think it's incredibly important. This is the Graduate right School District Diversity and Equity Committee, and they're the ones that told us. They're the ones that said, hey, you know, we do all this other training at the beginning of the year. Why don't we do a training that has retained bias? And so, um, Michael Bowen, Catherine Daniels, David Dillon, I know that I was very generally and all the same and very much other. Bunch of my teammates, Gabrielle and I, and I know if you're down the top, which is the other way, it's the middle of the district, Phil Rodriguez, Paul Ripley, Gary Ann Schmidt, Patty Schneider, Marie Stinsia, Danielle Wilkinson, Stephanie Williams, Rogers, and myself, and Roxanne, and we're all part of that community. I did it with you. I was a middle school DPD, congratulations. Why is school bias you? It's a culture of belongingness that exists for people to fly within an organization where they choose to stay. And so this pertains to non linear students, but also pertains to our staff as a whole. Bias is universal. We're a diverse community working together, everyone has biases. Number two, supporting inclusive district culture. Inclusive schools and districts better support all students and staff increasing creativity, engagement, and innovation. And three, increased personal awareness. Awareness of our unintentional or automatic responses enables us to be more inclusive. Awareness of our biases helps us understand the potential impact on our students and that are the best and most important piece of our programs. Why bias? So it's selected upon a collaboration with the Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, it gives us the ability to train all USD staff efficiently. It's a research based program, it's a reputable organization, um, and experience in a variety of industries, education, public, and private sector organizations. And this supports our USD district program number four, which is. So, what, you know, what is BiaSync? So, BiaSync is an online platform. So, it's an online tool where our staff will go through a series of modules um, in order to explore information around biases, diversity, openness, empathy, and inclusion. Um, the modules are divided and they're not intended to be done in one sitting in this about an hour and a half. An hour and 45 minutes, two hours worth of total training time, so obviously not one city, but to be all um, in order. And our staff actually has all the way until the end of February to complete this to allow for the timing and um, accommodate the requirements in, within our collective bargaining agreements. So, what's included in the training? There's a variety of video lessons, uh, they're quite engaging, very, very well and professionally done. There are two implicit association tests, an openness and empathy test or assessment and a survey, and then a survey about um, cultural um, climate inclusivity. 
So those assessments do uh, are recorded and the results are provided to the district, um, but it does not provide, it's all anonymous, does not include any specific information or personally identifiable information. So we get aggregate results or the overall results that we can look at to help us apply our future work in the area of diversity and equity across our district. And then also we'll have the ability to look at some groups within our district or disaggregated data. Obviously, this groups would need to be 10 or more in order to be anonymous. So that may help us also identify areas of need across the district. Part of that process is facilitated by YC personnel at the end of the session once the initial training is occurred. Then in addition, um, part of the feedback from the Diversity and Equity Committee was an uh, opportunity for people to possibly come and discuss what they're learning or ask questions. And so we have three planned open forum sessions, one which was Monday that I hosted. We had three people join for a bit of time, and then we'll be having one in December, and then another one in January. We also, in our presentation to staff, provided some um, tips on how they could address the situation or talk about what their experience as they go through the modules, knowing that sometimes these um, modules can be somewhat uncomfortable for people personally. That's our reason. Question? Yes. Uh, would it be possible to incorporate the board members to receive this information and to use the modules and uh, Sure, I can definitely send your um, email information on to you by a second if you will. Um, All right. You will have some downtime next week. I'm not sure you'll get it right next week. <laughs> get it down to Ben and ask that. Yeah. Again, that was a good information on it. Thank you very much. Right. Standing here, so I think I'll just stand facing you. I think I've got a couple of issues in the next couple items. I'm going to provide my memory on what order to go. So I think the first order is our sunshine, our joint sunshine with CSBA, our CLC, and the district. That is a tough meeting. Exactly. Okay. Um, so this is, you know, as we did last month with. Today, this is the Sunshine with a classified liaison committee that represents the majority of the classified staff. In this situation, we work collaboratively to determine the articles that we wish to discuss. And so, what you see in front of you is the list of what um, topics that we wish to discuss this year. This is an action item. I know we revised it on the Two, uh, Carpet Party and Joint Sunshine with the CLC and the USC. Thank you, sir. Okay. A motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the item 10.8, the 2021 22 Collective Party and Sunshine, Sigma Phi and SAI. Aye. Opposed, 10.8. That's an approved 10.9, which is the approval of the 2021 22. So this is the sunshine from the district to CSEA. Um, CSEA wasn't able to provide us their articles in time for the work that we're going to post. When we've done this before, where the district has sunshine before CSEA is a way to start the process. So we'll be able to figure out the articles today. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a action item. Do I have a motion to approve the 2021 22? Collective bargaining session. Okay. I have a motion to approve the 2021 22 collective bargaining session. Currently, we'll just talk about the voices that are identified. Second. There is a motion in the second to approve the 2021 22 collective bargaining session. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And this is an action item, 10.10 10 approval of the tenant to the agreement. I'm very excited to share with you that CSA has ratified the tenant agreement that we reached with them a couple of weeks ago. And so um, 
that typically is supporting you tonight for your involvement in the investigation. I move that we approve item 10.10, the approval of the agreement for the CSEA chapter 95. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve 10.10, the attempt to agreement. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Approval of the attempt to agreement is approved. Congratulations to the bargaining groups. 10.11 is the first reading of board policy. Board of bylaws and administrative regulations exists. This is just here as a standard for your information and come back for action next time. If you have any questions in the meantime, welcome to reach out. Mm -hmm. On the contract, you mentioned that there's two questions. One, what is the benefit of including a technical assistance intervention session? So that's, um, it's a requirement from, it's just a change of the law, so we're through, that's, they're not following so the policies are updated based on the changes in the law to the health Okay, so where are they going now? Michael, do you know? I don't have that policy right in front of me, but um, I know that, that was a recommendation. That was a recommendation to remove from CSDA. I didn't remove it. I think it's. I, I don't. Okay, so we removed it. I see that it was removed because it's now um, a part of it has another board policy. And so my question then was, you know, why are we doing it from the health practice? Because it's now another board policy. Sorry about it. But if I had it wrong, I think I had it well online. Yeah, so oftentimes um, the the law forces us to change board policies and that comes through a service that we have that provides the updates and where that gets shifted. Um, we can research that and get back to you if you like. Yeah, actually, my, my concern is that the bill is going to form the rules and the funding and priorities, and so we're removing this section. I just wanted to understand what the benefit was. Then, well, technical, technical assistance was a state program. It has nothing to do with that, and it really has nothing to do with health care. It was a program for, for um, districts that didn't meet certain data points. So based on the dashboard, if you didn't meet certain levels, then you were put in technical assistance. It, it has no relationship to health care, so I don't know why it was in there in the first place. I think it's CSDA's realization that it doesn't fit in there anymore. And the only clarifying question that I had is at the end, it talks about, uh, it just, uh, talks about the trash and the number of student achievement percentage of students that successfully completed all college metrics courses and career technical education courses. That doesn't apply to our district, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? The next item, the next area is board member comment or any request for future agenda items. Well, before I close, I want to thank everybody here um, for all their hard work. Um, everything you guys is deeply appreciated. I hope you guys have a, a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving week. We do appreciate everything everybody's doing with the staff, the teachers, everybody in the district office. Um, you guys, who would have thought we'd still be dealing with so many COVID issues two years later? It's just incredible. Uh, but you guys keep your heads up and uh, hopefully. Uh, I think I say this every month, but hopefully the event is soon here. But uh, if anybody doesn't know how much I appreciate everything everybody does, we certainly do. So uh, that goes for everybody except the principals who left. But, uh, <laughs> but that's serious. So thank you so much. And uh, for the people that stuck around, thank you very much. You guys are true person. So have a good night. Thank you.
get that. Uh, the next regular board meeting will be held on December 15th, 2021. Uh, and I'm assuming we'll announce the location at a later time. I'm not sure if we're going to keep this one. We'll see what happens. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, be safe. Thank you.